What happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project, 1981. One of my favorite parts about doing the 80s project is seeing what was really popular, like what trends really kicked off. Like in 1980, I had to watch a bunch of cannibal movies and I wasn't very happy about that, but thanks to Friday the 13th, the slasher boom was in full swing and 1981 so far is chock full of movies riding that wave. And this block is no exception, as you'll soon see since we not only have movies inspired by that one, but one straight up remaking it, and one, well, continuing it. We're kicking off this block in Spain on April 17th with the film Bloody Moon, although it didn't get an American run until 1983. It begins with a young man who is horribly scarred on his face, and he grabs some tiny plastic Mickey Mouse mask and somehow tricks a random woman that he's her boyfriend? Like, like for some reason, uh, she is that easily fooled, so I guess I'm blaming alcohol, but when the mask comes off, she freaks out and he kills her, which lands him in the asylum. Years later, he's released into his sister's care and taken into his aunt's boarding school for young women. And things turn quickly as Auntie is killed by being set on fire. New student Angela then finds herself in the middle of intrigue as more murders occur, or is she going crazy? So this one was by Jess Franco, and this is his third film on the project so far, which is pretty wild considering that we're only in the first year and a half of the 1980s, but he previously directed both White Cannibal Queen and Devil Hunter, and I covered this before in a video of Lost 80s Slashers, and, and I commented on this there, but this film has a character that I find hilarious. You, you have this college girl, Inga, and I suppose that she just meets this guy on the side of the road and gets in his car because she thinks that the car is cool. Like she doesn't know him and, and she says that she doesn't know where they're going. So she's just letting a stranger take her somewhere that she doesn't know. And she gets out and it's an old abandoned factory and she, and she just follows him. Like she even notes that he doesn't seem too cheerful and he goes ahead and she just follows like, like some golden retriever or something. Then she lets him tie her up on an old stone. Like, like, she's, like she's game for it. She even says he's wearing a mask. To, to recap, a man she does not know pulls up in a car wearing a mask and she gets in the car and he takes her to a murder factory where she just lets him tie her up on a big old rock. Then, when he starts up this massive power saw, she still doesn't sound too worried. And like, I, I don't want to say that this character deserved to die, but I am going to say that if she didn't get killed here, it, it was just a matter of time. She was just too naive to live, really. Of course, after release, it got into some trouble when it made the UK video nasty list and was banned there. My rating on it is a two and a half. It, it's not terrible or anything. There, there's some entertaining bits, but it doesn't really add up to all that much. And it has some real dull moments. Its horror cultural significance is a two since it is a forgotten slasher film, uh, but it is by Franco and it did make the nasty list. Should you watch it? Possibly, it, it's not a bad watch. You never know what to expect. You don't have to do all this, you know. I wasn't planning on running away. I said I was game for anything. Our next film came out on April 24th, and it's a touch more highbrow entry with The Hand. It starts with a comics artist, and there's no mistaking that gorgeous Barry Windsor Smith artwork, but it's actually by Hoagie, who's playing a comic strip artist here, and his marriage is in trouble, which leads to a car accident in which his hand is severed. They're unable to find the hand in order to reattach it, and then his cat, in a scene that's not hilarious at all, jumps out a window. And then, oh no, it appears as if his severed hand has a bit of a life of its own, and Jonathan has to adjust to a new artist on his strip, having weird fever dreams about his faucets. But the new artist turns out to be Roger Rabbit, and he runs into this bum who is played by Oliver freaking Stone who is strangled by the hand. And Stone played that bum 
because he directed this film. Yep, The Hand, a movie about a killer disembodied hand, was by Oliver Stone as one of his earliest works. And this was sort of the last movie he would make before taking a sharp turn into more upscale films, as his next two movies would be Salvador and freaking Platoon. There was some serious talent behind this, since the hand effects were by Carlo Rambaldi, the creator of E.T., and the score was by James Horner, another of his earlier pieces. D-Day pops in, and rather famously, Kane referred to this as one of his paycheck films, movies that he took simply because he needed money for a particular reason. This one was because he needed a new garage. It was a bit of an all-around bust when it came out, getting some pretty bad reviews, and didn't do too well at the box office, only pulling in about two and a half million bucks, when the budget was more than twice that, and often ends up on lists of terrible movies made by great directors. I'm not gonna call it terrible though, since I'm gonna give it a three, and though I won't call it terrible, I am gonna call it not good. Uh, like it has some wild fun moments and some sluggish ones, and its significance, is the same, also a three. Although it was in no way a hit, it certainly has clout what with being an early stone film, Kane's presence, and a bit of a novelty for being kind of a B movie from a future A-list director. Should you watch it? Sure, why not? On that same day in Italy, we get, oh great, another cannibal movie, my favorite. But it's Cannibal Ferox, and it's by Umberto Lenzi, who made Eaten Alive, which was featured in the 1980 Project episodes, and this has Robert Kerman in it, who was not only in Eaten Alive, but also in Cannibal Holocaust. And of course, uh, Debbie Does Dallas. Uh, it also has a trio on a trip into the rainforest in order to locate a lost village, and wants to disprove that cannibals exist in the jungle. They end up having to go on foot, and they encounter a couple of dead natives, and then run into two guys, one of whom is Giovanni Radice, who has been on the project a few times already. This is his fourth appearance. He was in Cannibal in the Streets, City of the Living Dead, and House on the Edge of the Park. He and his friend are drug runners, and like Cannibal Holocaust, and actually perhaps too many of the cannibal films, it does contain several scenes of actual animal cruelty. But there's versions, like apparently the one that I have, that have removed or altered the animal violence. And this one didn't get released until 1983 in the US where it was titled Make Them Die Slowly, where it was called the most violent film ever made. And when Mike kills one of the tribe for no reason, which of course makes them seek out their vengeance, coming after the group and setting up a series of over the top gross out effects, which of course landed this one on the video nasty list. And in fact, this was one of the poster children for the nasties. And the movie wore it like a badge of honor, proudly proclaiming that it was banned in 31 countries, which is maybe possibly true if you really wanna expand your definition of the word ban, because that was more of a marketing gimmick than anything. Its most notorious bits are a castration scene and a woman hung up by her breasts. And this one really took off in terms of notoriety as the whole band thing worked in its favor to get people to want to see it. My rating on it is a 2.5 because honestly, it's, it's really not that different from the other 20 cannibal movies. Like it moves a little bit more than most of the others, but it's still not exactly a great watch. Its HCS is higher though at a 3.5 since it did sort of become the poster child of the video nasties and became one of the more talked about gore flicks of that era. Should you watch it? Probably. It, its reputation deserves at least a watch through, but just know that it's not really as good nor as gory as it's propped up to be. Can't take this nightmare anymore! Four days later, on April 28th, in the United States, another of the classic slashes was released with Bloody Birthday. It begins back in 1970, and there's a big eclipse just as a bunch of babies are being born. It then jumps 10 years to 1980, and a young couple is killed. There's also this group of kids that all have the same birthday being born under that eclipse, including Buddy from Just One of the Guys, as a little dude. And they spy on Debbie's older sister, who's Julie Brown. Like, just say Julie, not Wubba Wubba Wubba. 
these kids are evil and kill the sheriff and lock another kid in a fridge, although he does manage to escape. They also shoot their teacher dead. And, and I know what you're saying, so what, right? Well, that was a big deal back in 1981, not an every other day thing. And then they all just start causing chaos all around town. And Jose Ferrer is here, and, and this guy is a Hollywood legend himself and also the father of the amazing Miguel Ferrer. And the director here was Ed Hunt, and he did some horror here and there, but he never really had a big directing career. He only did three films after this, and one was in 2014, 33 years after this. And it was originally simply titled Happy Birthday, but they altered the title in order to avoid confusion with Happy Birthday to Me, which would release a short while afterwards. Kind of funny, but the, but the teacher that was shot was named Viola Davis, uh, my woman king, and there's also a small role for the American ninja, Michael Dudikoff, and also William Boyette, who you'll mostly remember as the I want this car guy from the hidden, but also this one managed to get better reviews than other slashers of the time, possibly due to its rather unusual antagonists and its focus on character stuff more so than just killing. It didn't do that well at the box office, killing any chances for the sequel that they wanted to set up with the ending though. And I enjoy this one, I'm giving it a three and a half. It's not great and it has some dull bits, but it's overall pretty damn enjoyable. Its significance is a three, since it is a bit more well known, but doesn't really have any horror actors, nor anyone notable behind the scenes, and didn't make a big splash at the time. Should you watch it? Yeah, definitely. Hey. What happened? Mom, Daddy fell! Mom, Daddy fell! One day later, April 29th, in Italy, we get one of the bigger releases of the year, at least for me, with The Beyond. This starts in Louisiana in 1927, at a hotel and a group of townspeople who murder a painter for what they say is black magic, and that the hotel is built over one of the seven doors of evil. He's tortured and walled up in the basement, and then it just jumps to 1981, and Liza is inheriting the old hotel. But weird things start happening immediately. Dr. McCabe shows up, played by the late great David Warbeck, and when a worker accidentally uncovers the body of Schweik, which kills him, and Liza encounters blind Emily, who may or may not have been the woman who was present in 1927. Soon, a series of weird events happen like death via sulfuric acid, haunted paintings, visions of Schweik, man eating tarantula attacks, and you know, that was another fear way back when that has kind of went away. Like, people used to be really afraid that tarantulas were everywhere and gonna get you. And this was another film from Lucio Fulci, the second part of his Gates of Hell trilogy, which began in 1980's City of the Living Dead. In my opinion, the strongest work of his catalog. The film's production was reportedly pretty wild, considering that rumors circulate that there was no actual shooting script, and it was only a three-page treatment outlining what happens in the film, and that much of the story changed while shooting since Fulci claimed to constantly be coming up with something better. Since the film was shot in Louisiana and most of the actors spoke English, while Fulci only spoke Italian, much of the directing was done either through an interpreter or through miming. It didn't get released in the US until 1983, where it was renamed Seven Doors of Death, which had a different score and was shorter, but was later released in the full form under its original title on the home market. The film's excessive gore earned it a place on the video nasty list, of course, and critics were pretty split on it as a result. Roger Ebert, rather harsh on horror films, dubbed it as one of his most hated films, but other critics praised his visual stylings. Over time, it became a cult sensation and its reputation has only grown, taking on an entirely new life. And it's pretty wild that there's back-to-back -back episodes of the project featuring Fulci films, and they're about as different as they can be. My rating on this one is a four and a half. I love this film, I love everything about it, but I do like slightly wish that it had a little more coherent plot line, which is why I can't give it the five, but it's just so damn good and atmospheric and worth watching anytime. 
Its significance is the same since it's become Fulci's most revered work, has shown up on a number of greatest horror film of all time lists, and is one of the must-sees of Italian horror cinema. It doesn't get the full five though, because of it still sitting at more of a cult status in the US instead of the mainstream success that it truly deserved. Should you watch it? Absolutely. You will not regret it. Next up, just a few days later, on May 1st, we get another American entry with Graduation Day, which kicks off with a pretty jamming theme song. This one begins with a big track meet and Laura here collapsing and dying, and then jumps a few months with her sister Anne coming back in town, uh, just in time for, you guessed it, Graduation Day. I mean, it's in, it's in the title. Meanwhile, a killer is on the loose and kills Paula here, who, by the way, is Linda Shane, who both acted in and wrote the bizarre sex comedy film Screwballs and Screwballs 2. And the track coach is Christopher George, who you may remember from City of the Living Dead, but you'll probably mostly recognize him from the greatest death scene of all time. Kane has a rough relationship with her stepfather and is a bit creepy with other members of the track team while someone stalks them, including a very young Vanna White in her second film ever, with her first one being Midnight Offerings, which I covered in episode two of the 81 project. And there's a pretty wild scene with Sally as she does a slow motion routine on the bars while Coach Michaels looks on, like constantly licking his lips. Uh, before the killer shows up in fencing gear. And a young Linnea Quigley shows up in her first, but certainly not her last appearance on the project. And before she became a horror icon, and, and she wasn't originally in the film. Her character, Dolores, was played by this girl here, who we see earlier in the number 46 jersey, but when it came down to shooting the nude scene, this girl said she wouldn't do it. So they fired her and cut her from the film, replacing her as much as they can with Linnea, who they hired in her place. The director here was Herb Freed, who we already encountered in 1980 with Beyond Evil, and this one was a bit of a surprise success. Even though it received mostly negative reviews from the critics at the time, it rode the wave of the slasher boom to make a solid profit. It only cost a quarter of a million bucks to make and raked in almost 24 million in the theaters and has since developed a strong cult following. Hey, give me my ball. <laughs> My rating on this one is a three because it's fun and all, but it's pretty standard stuff and fairly predictable. It's not, it's not a bad movie per se, but it is a little forgettable amidst the other slashers of the era that stand out a bit more. Its significance is a three as well because it was a success and is decently known, but outside of Linnea's small part, it doesn't feature a lot of horror icons on camera or behind it and never quite hit that more known status. Should you watch it? Yeah, it's definitely a good time and worth checking out. I'm gonna nail your ass tonight. I don't think that meant the same thing in 81 as it does now, now. Or, or does it? On that same day, May 1st, there was another horror release with The Nesting, and it has an author who wrote a book, also called The Nesting, and she's incredibly agoraphobic, and in an effort to try to overcome it, she heads up to the countryside where she discovers a house that looks just like the one from the cover of her book, a place she described for her imagination to the cover artist. So she decides to rent it from Count Dracula. On her first night there, she's plagued by a terrible dream that's actually a memory she shut out, and spooky stuff starts and she's trapped on the roof, so when her psychiatrist stops by, he accidentally falls to his death. Later, a ghostly presence saves Lauren from being assaulted by a handyman, and the director here was Armand Weston, who also co-wrote the film, and this was his only mainstream film. 
The rest of his works were in the adult industry, although it appears as if his films would fall more under the category of erotica, more so than straight up pornography. And even though the title makes it sound like it's some sort of like a, like a killer animal movie, and the poster makes it look like, like a slasher flick, this is a slow burn ghost story more than anything else. The ghost in question was the former owner of the house, which used to be a brothel run by a woman named Florinda Costello, played by Gloria Graham, Oscar and Golden Globe winning actress, and possibly most known for It's a Wonderful Life. But this would turn out to be her final film, as she died that same year. And this is another one that fell into the whole video nasty debacle, although escaped prosecution, but copies were confiscated and didn't get a UK distribution, which is weird because the level of violence is pretty low. My rating on it is a two and a half. It's kind of standard and a little slow, but it's not terrible or anything. Its significance is a two since it's, it's not well known and doesn't, didn't really make any horror dense, although the presence of Carradine and Graham, plus its nasty designation, push it to the two. Should you watch it? Maybe. If you prefer low-key ghost tales, sure, sure. I ain't saying I like your kind, and I ain't saying I don't, but I got better things to do than type on your writer. This next one could have been in the last episode since it debuted in Japan in April of 81, but its US debut was on May 1st, and it's Savage Harvest. And it starts with a crawl telling us that the events are based on a true story. And we're set in a village in Africa where a lion is on the attack. There's an American family here living on a plantation, including Maggie here and her husband, Derek. But her ex-husband also lives here, and it's Captain Dallas. And it appears as if the attacks are increasing, like this Black Panther on the hunt, and then some hyenas chowing down on a dude. They soon start coming for the family and killing one of their servants, and the director here is Robert Collins, who also wrote the film. And this was only one of two films that he directed for the big screen, with the rest of his work being TV shows and TV movies. And although the opening tells us that it's based on true events, it, it's another one of those, well, this didn't exactly happen per se, but the drought was real and the animals did attack people. So, so it's true in that sense. And it, that did happen and there were animal attacks, but the story of an isolated American family stuck in a house while lions tried to get in is purely fictional. Later that same year, the film Roar was released, which was vaguely similar, although less horror oriented. And that one got more attention due to the sheer carelessness of the animal control and the behind the scenes stories of the cast and crew that were harmed by the lions. But that one doesn't have a weirdly unintentionally hilarious scene of a lion killing and dragging off a guy while the family is in the other room, singing the Beatles. My rating on it is a two and a half. It, it's entertaining enough and it has some good stuff. Like there's, there's some fairly funny bits with the lions and very obvious dummies and some nice tension. Its significance is pretty low since it's not well remembered and often overshadowed by roar and didn't make much impact on the horror scene. Should you watch it? Possibly. I mean, it's fun enough for a watch. I want to hold your hand. I hold Our next film doesn't have a set release date, but this seemed an appropriate place to put it. Uh, but we do know that it was released in Indonesia in 1981, and it's Sri Gala. It has this vaguely Indiana Jones looking dude, although this was well before that came out, and his two employees staying at this old cabin in the woods by a lake. And they're looking for a lost treasure in the water. But there's also a group of young folk headed out for a vacation, hanging out there as well, and there's someone watching them in the woods. And then a mysterious figure begins attacking them, leading to a speedboat chase, and by this point it's kind of hard to tell, but this was considered an Indonesian remake of Friday the 13th, although not really a direct one as you can tell from the, uh, maybe, maybe you missed me saying it, uh, speedboat chase. But oh no, there's also kung fu fights and zombie dream sequences, 
but it starts to look a little bit more familiar as it goes on with a big storm and everyone is stuck in the cabin at night with people wandering out into the rain with flashlights. But it's kind of weird that it's billed as a remake considering how different a large portion of it is. The cabin certainly looks similar though, and the setting with everyone in rain ponchos with their flashlights does look really familiar. And the version that I found with subtitles, I'm, I'm going to assume is inaccurate considering this scene with a woman calling out for her friend saying her name over and over and over, read as both uh, the various kinds of meatball noodles. And then the phantom, where is this? And it kind of makes me mad because I was going to name my second daughter various kinds of meatball noodles. Well, then in the last 15 minutes or so of the movie, this one absolutely basically just turns into Friday the 13th. And when this older female character just randomly shows up out of nowhere, even though we've never seen her before in the film, I think you can kind of guess where this is going. My rating on it is a two and a half. It's silly at times and actually does a good job of imitating that Friday vibe, but it's a little slower than that one, even with the uh, speedboat chases. It's HCS is a one and a half since it's not really known at all and it's only notoriety is basically just being a Friday ripoff. Should you watch it? M most likely not, unless you're just really into watching international knockoff flicks. This block gives us another heavy hitter, also arriving on May 1st, a, a kind of busy day for horror, and it's Friday the 13th Part 2. Coming out a little less than one year after the original, it starts off with killing off the previous film's final girl, Alice, murdered by an unseen man. We're then sent back to Crystal Lake, and there's a new camp there, just a little down the road from the last one, and a new assortment of teenagers. We're told that it's been five years after Pamela went on her rampage, and it's crazy to think about it now, but this film had the unusual task of trying to make a sequel to a film in which the main villain was extremely, decidedly killed off. So, once again, it was a murder mystery. Now, keep in mind, the concept of Friday the 13th movies being about Jason Voorhees was not a thing at this point. As far as the viewers were concerned, Jason was a little kid that drowned in the lake and then popped up at the end of the last one in a possible dream sequence. The idea that he would be the killer was not a certainty, but it sure was to someone. Like you see, originally Frank Mancuso Sr. of Paramount Pictures thought it would be a good idea to make Friday the 13th Part 2 a completely separate concept. He wanted to make it an anthology series each year on a Friday the 13th with a different setting and concept, kind of like Carpenter wanted to do later on with Halloween. However, several of the producers who were involved in the money process insisted that the killer be Jason from the first film and be a continuation of that story. Sean S. Cunningham, director of the first one, decided not to return because he just couldn't get behind that idea. So Steve Miner, who had served as an associate producer on the original, stepped in to take over. This one introduces one of the series' most popular final girls, Ginny, and is essentially the first film that establishes the formula that would carry throughout the next, I, I don't know, like 20 movies, with Jason stalking the kids unseen for the first portion of the film, only to be revealed in the last act for a final showdown. And, and oh yeah, about that reveal. Jason's look is not quite what you'd expect since the hockey mask wouldn't be introduced until the next movie and instead wears a set of overalls and a burlap sack on his head, reminiscent of the killer from the town that dreaded sundown. Of course, it was met with a gaggle of negative reviews from the critics at the time and rather notoriously, this was the final Friday film that Roger Ebert did a review of in his column. He wrote that it was a terrible movie, giving it half a star, saying that the review will remain for any future Friday the 13th movies. And it did quite well, but not, not nearly as well as the first one did. They, they upped the budget from half a million bucks to one and a quarter million and had a strong opening weekend. 
pulling in 6 million and going on to amass almost 22 million, but that was less than half of the first. So even though its haul was greatly diminished, it still made a ton, giving a clear indication that our favorite murderous hillbilly was here to stay. And my rating on this one is a four. It's a great slasher flick with some actual characters and tense situations. I, I, I can't really rank it higher though, because let's face it, for a good portion of the runtime, it's essentially just a repeat of the first one. Its significance though is a five, because you don't get more important than giving us Jason freaking Voorhees. This is the one that sets him up as the star of the show and gives us the framework for not only future Friday films, but a multitude of clones as well. Should you watch it? Oh, no doubt. Excuse me, are there any after hours places around here? Sure are. Sure. Oh. So there you have it. There's that bunch of movies uh, from like April and May of 1981. And I have a very clear favorite in this batch. I know Friday fans might be mad at me, but my favorite here is The Beyond. I love that movie so, so much. It beats anything else in this list. And it's one of my contenders for, for best movies of this year. We'll see when we get uh, a little bit closer to the end of this year. Let me know which was of your favorite from this block. Tell me down below. I want to hear which one you liked the most. Uh, if you also liked The Beyond, or maybe you liked one of the others. Maybe Graduation Day was, was, was a guilty pleasure for you. I don't know. Let me know that down below. Please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the 80s project and want to see more videos of it. And check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines and help support this channel and keep the project going. And yeah, keep on watching these videos. I'm, I'm really having a great time doing it. And uh, I want to keep on going through all these years, every single year of the 1980s, right here on the 80s project. <laughs>